Uh, so a very good morning to everyone. Uh, I, Dr. Poonam Joshi, welcome you all once again to our Attrack Hedonic uh, Academic Program. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Ratan Shetty. Dr. Ratan is associate professor and a dear friend, and he is uh, in the Department of Hedonic Surgical Oncology, Attrack, uh, Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Ratan. Would be speaking on the complications and the management post thyroidectomy. Uh, now I would request Dr. Ratan to please go ahead with the presentation. Over to you, Dr. Ratan. Good Hello. Hello. Hello, Mandel. Ha, Dr. Ratan, are you there? Hello. Hello. One minute, please. Recording. Hello, Dr. Ratan, are you there? Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes, Dr. Ratan, you can go ahead with the morning, madam. Uh, shall I start? Yes, yes, please.
we can yeah, see the yeah. yeah yeah please go yeah good morning uh, everyone uh, and uh, thank you poona madam for uh, providing me this opportunity today i'll be talking about management of complications post thyroidectomy that is when the complications have occurred i'm not go extensively on to various techniques where we can uh, you know prevent these complications coming to the overview thyroidectomy hello am i audible yes hello. you are you are please go ahead doctor yeah so coming to the overview thyroidectomy is one of the most commonly performed procedures in the world and it's relatively safe with very low post operative morbidity and mortality rates in experience times and uh, but complications do occur especially in our setting where we operate on uh, malignant patients and sometimes very rarely the complications can be life threatening today we'll discuss about various uh, complications and its management coming to the history a uh, century ago thyroid surgery was one of the most uh, dangerous surgery with a mortality approximating around 40% and theodore cocker reduced the mortality and morbidity associated with thyroid surgery for which he got a nobel prize uh, even in the various series where theodore cocker had uh, published the the incidence of uh, uh, myxedema was was uh, quite high but uh, titani was not there because cocker was a very meticulous surgeon he used to ligate and uh, precisely dissect the thyroid gland so the complete thyroidectomy was done but uh, back then they did not have any option of supplementing thyroid hormone so most of the patients ended with thyroid, uh, myxedema but very few of the cocker patients developed titani that is the, in most of his cases he probably must have preserved the parathyroid gland whereas in bill roth who was supposed to be a very fast surgeon he used to be very uh, rapid in his surgery back back in those days anesthesia techniques were not very well developed probably that was the reason and in his cases the titani was uh, uh, very often but mixed edema seldom seen probably because he must have left some amount of thyroid tissue which prevented uh, hypothyroidism coming to various complications the most common one of the very frequent complication is hypoparathyroidism leading to hypocalcemia much more infrequently that those are neural complications like recurrent laryngeal nerve injury injury to the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve post operative bleeding injury to thoracic duct laryngeal edema bronchospasm tracheal injury esophageal injury then less i mean uh, minor complications like seroma infection and hypertrophic scar coming to the hypocalcemia these are fairly frequent and usually transient in most cases around 85 to 90% of the time the hypocalcemia is transient so how do you define hypocalcemia that is total serum calcium less than 8 mg normal level is 8 to 9.5 1 one gram decrease in serum calcium leads to about 0.8 decrease in total calcium levels and uh, any ionized calcium less than 3.8 mg per deciliter is considered hypocalcemia we have to differentiate between transient and permanent there is a great variability in calcium level at which patient becomes symptomatic sometimes the calcium may be only 7 and uh, patient may still may not be symptomatic that is mainly because of the ionic calcium levels if ionic calcium levels are normal the patient may not be symptomatic even when the total calcium level is uh, subnormal chronic post surgical hypoparathyroidism what that is permanent hypoparathyroidism is now defined as those lasting for at least 12 months after surgery this is after this international uh, uh, task force guidelines uh, uh, in 2022 where they defined as chronic uh, hypoparathyroidism uh, la is lasting those lasting for at least 12 months previously in 2016 the task force had defined it as those lasting for 6 months but now they have increased it to 12 months coming to signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia the uh, parathyroid has a very short half life around 3 to 5 minutes and the calcium levels there is a immediate drop in uh, parathyroid level whenever there is inadvertent and injury to the parathyroid glands but the drop in calcium is usually seen between 24 to 48 hours after surgery endogenous parathyroid requires some time to drop and the calcium level drops between 24 to 48 hours after surgery subtle signs can be seen if uh, there is minor uh, uh, in minor uh, hypercalcemia like perioral or digital paresthesias muscle cramping or anxiety chostex sign is uh, hyperexcitability of the facial nerve which can be demonstrated by tapping the facial nerve at the angle of the jaw 
one thing we should remember is 20% of normal individuals will also have a positive trauma sign. Trauma sign is ischemia induced capillary spasm. In uh, severe hypercalcemia, patient can develop titanium arterial mental stages, also seizure. This is because of no hyper excitability and cardiac complications, sometimes arrhythmias causing death. Bronchospasm and laryngospasm can also occur, and this can be uh, 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 exacerb exacerbated, especially in a setting where there is nerve injury. Like I mentioned, nearly all patients drop calcium levels in first 24 hours after surgery who have had uh, injury to the parathyroid. A true cal uh, hypocalcemia that will require supplementation usually occurs 24 to 48, uh, 48 hours after surgery. Because of this stunning effect on the parathyroid gland, there will be some amount of decrease in parathyroid, but most of the patients will be symptomatic by 24 to 48 hours. What is the etiology? Etiology is inadvertent injury to the parathyroid gland and inadvertent removal of the parathyroid. Incidence is around 20 to 10 to 20% of thyroid cases, most likely in operations for malignancies and extensive central compartment nodes. Sometimes parathyroid may be intrathyroidal around 0. 0.5 to 4%. This is impossible to avoid. Parathyroids are between uh, four to sometimes supranumerary parathyroid glands are seen up to 12 in number. Now risk factors are large thyroid in, especially in a setting where there is uh, no, uh, extensive no, vascularity like in Grace disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis uh, and malignancies with extensive uh, nodal metastasis. Uh, Hello. In this setting, consult the patient preoperatively about the higher risk of hypercalcemia. What are the surgical agents that can be used? Immunofluorescence imaging can be used to see the check the vascularity, but this is useful when you have visually identified the gland. If you do not have, if you have not identified the gland visually, then using immunofluorescence to localize parathyroid glands is not very easy. Parathyroid gland has autofluorescence. You can use infrared uh, camera to uh, you know visualize the parathyroid gland. In a randomized trial, uh, indocenin green fluorescence uh, has been used to check the uh, predictive parathyroid function and the author demonstrated that ICG imaging, which can re reliably predict the uh, vascularity of the gland, uh, can predict postoperative gland function and uh, uh, you can start prophylactic calcium supplementation in patients where the vascularity is compromised. Intraoperative management, briefly we'll talk like the techniques and all. Uh, uh, is beyond the scope of this topic. Examination of the su surgical system whenever you have uh, completed the surgery to check for inadvertent and removal of parathyroid glands. Whenever you uh, check the parathyroid glands, in a malignant setting, you can take a part of the gland and send for a frozen section to identify that it's a parathyroid gland and then auto-implantation can be done into this uh, viable sternocleidomastoid muscle or uh, into the arm, the brachial radialis. Otherwise, uh, you can mince it, I mean, bottom filtration requires mincing, or you can make it into a suspension and inject into the, into a viable muscle, not into a muscle which has been retracted and which has turned black, where the parathyroid may, uh, tissue may not survive. Steps to prevent hypercalcemia is identification of preoperative risk factors, medical, surgical techniques, and pro prophylactic uh, calcium supplementation. Symptomatic hypercalcemia requires, uh, uh, if it is less than seven, severe uh, uh, hypercalcemia requires uh, IV calcium gluconate, about uh, one to two ampules of 10% solution of calcium gluconate containing 90 to 180 milligram of elemental calcium in 50 ml of 5% uh, dextrose over 10 to 20 minutes, followed by slower infusion of calcium gluconate at the rate of 0.5 to 1.5 milligram per kg per hour over eight to 10 hour period, along with oral calcium supplementation. So does uh, auto transplantation, what we have been made to believe all these years is auto transplantation is a, uh, should be done whenever uh, uh, there is inordinate removal, but the meta analysis the, uh, doesn't show any uh, promising results. So there are, I mean, the heterogeneous studies, 25 independent studies involving 10,500 patients. It has shown that even at six months, Parathyroid gland auto-transplantation was significantly associated with increased post hypercalcemia and pro protracted hypothyroidism. 
and the number of photoplastic parathyroid glands which have been implanted that is one versus two two had higher incidence of uh, hypocalcemia at six months that is about two times higher risk of hypocalcemia so but at one year the hypocalcium rate decreased but still there was hypoparathyroidism so not as effective as a intraoperative preservation of parathyroid gland whenever you identify the parathyroid gland try to preserve the vascularity particularize it and move it laterally suppose if you see color change that is probably because of the venous engorgement you can incise the capsule relieve the pressure and uh, if it uh, improves in color you can preserve the gland uh, in situ if it doesn't improve in color it becomes even darker and you can auto implant it by mincing it the arterial ischemia doesn't turn black the gland becomes pale it's not very easy to detect so most of the time when we see a dark gland that is because of venous insufficiency rather than arterial insufficiency so coming to prophylactic calcium supplementation or park at all uh, 90 patients randomized to group with supplementation and without supplementation incidence of both symptomatic and laboratory hypercalcemia is significantly lower when you use a calcium supplementation so prophylactic calcium very high pth we can send for pth about 6 hours post operatively if pth is low less than 10 start immediately on uh, rocaltrol and calcium that is 1.5 per oral q6 hourly about 3 to 4 mg um, grams of calcium per day Check total calcium day one and calcium uh, supplementation. Uh, uh, the dosage which is used in this table is quite high, but yeah, around three to four milligrams uh, in uh, uh, three to four grams in divided doses. Around three to four divided doses is the recommended uh, doses for calcium supplementation. If the pH is not low, then uh, no need, no need of calcium su supplementation. Uh, the supplementation can be very low, like one gram. Uh, Twice a day. I mean, one gram into two. That is two grams per day. So oral administration of three to four milligrams of elemental calcium carbonate, carbonate in three to four divided doses, and rocaltrol has to be supplemented 0.25 microgram TDS, usually for a week or ten days. Because most of the patients may have vitamin D insufficiency, which can exacerbate hypercalcemia. the uh, molecule use is calcium carbonate which are the best by uh, the uh, percentage of elemental calcium which is which is available for absorption is around 40 per mg coming to uh, hypomagnesemia sometimes there will be uh, no improvement in hypercalcemia even when you supplement with calcium that is probably because of hypomagnesemia which is not very common Uh, and when magnesium levels are less than 2 gram uh, uh, less than subnormal levels you have to supplement with magnesium sulfate iv or oral both are available so what any way of a, you know increasing the uh, uh, sensitivity of you know detecting uh, you know, hypercalcemia that is con combined calcium and pth thresholds can be checked 5 to 6 hours post op this fair very sensitive But yes, PTH essay is not available everywhere. And sixty no. percent decrease in PTH uh, 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 accurately predicts postoperative hypocalcemia. There is a there are various studies which have shown that a downward slope, a downward uh, trend of hypo, uh, calcium level or PTH level uh, accurately yeah. predicts hypocalcemia. To conclude, the essential part is prevention. In proper surgical techniques identify the parathyroid glands with with its uh, blood supply and uh, consider auto transplanting questionably viable parathyroids to avoid permanent hypercalcemia even even though solid evidence is lacking for this and hypercalcemia usually improves at around 1 to i mean 4 to 6 weeks at around 1 month if it is if there is prolonged then there is refractory hypercalcemia which may persist for 6 months but if it is beyond 1 year then it is called permanent hypercalcemia PTH essay can help you in postoperative management of thyroid thyroidectomy patients. Early discharge versus early supplementation. Like I mentioned before, more than 65% decline in PTH is highly predictive of postoperative hypercalcemia. Now coming to nerve palsies, the complications usually are like neural and non-neural. So coming to the neural complications, ex external branch of superior laryngeal nerve, which is a branch of the uh, uh, superior laryngeal nerve. 
So it runs along the thyroid pedicle and is identified at the upper le level at the uh, region of the jaws. <laughs> Can some can the audience mute? Yeah, sorry for that, Ratan. Uh, we, we are trying to do that. Thank you. Please mute yourself, all the uh, attendees, please. Yeah, coming to the external branch of superior laryngeal now. The injury to the uh, uh, this is a nerve which supplies the cricothyroid muscle, which is a uh, tensor of the vocal cord and usually identified that the superior pole of the thyroid. The Cernia classification has, there are various other classification systems, but Cernia is one, one which is the most popular, which has divided the, uh, classified these external branches superior laryngeal nerve into three uh, types. The type one is uh, the uh, EBSLN crosses superior thyroid vessels more than a centimeter above the upper edge of the thyroid superior pole. And in 68% of the patients, this is seen in small glands, but in, uh, Sorry. Yeah, in 68% uh, of the patient, this is the most common presentation in small glands and in small th thyroid swellings, and in 23% of patients in large goiters. Type 2 is ESBLN uh, cross, uh, uh, EBSLN crosses vessels less than a centimeter above the upper edge of the superior pole. It's seen in 18% of the patients with small gl uh, gland and 15% of the patients with large goiters. And 2B, this is the one which is with the highest risk of injury to the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve. That is in 14% of patients with small goiters and 54% of patients with large thyroid swellings. These are all for benign. This classification was for easy in the Western population and also in uh, mostly in goiters, which were benign. So in malignancies, this is highly unpredictable because if there is a nodule in the upper lobe, it can it can be uh, uh, very close to the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve. There are various techniques to preserve this, um, which is beyond the scope of this topic. But how do we manage management? We'll talk about management. So uh, in a uh, you know, Asian study investigated 92 external branch of superior laryngeal nerves during 50 thyroid operations conducted at Korea. Uh, found that type 1 EBSLN was observed in 15 of 92 nerves, that is 16.3 percent. Type 2A was seen in 56.5, and type 2B was seen in 27. So, whereas in Western population the type 1 was common, whereas here the type 2A was the most predominant type. This is also dependent on the type of uh, uh, patient that they were getting. Maybe the, the, the tumors were quite large. Patients with type 2A and 2B were at higher risk of injuries. And these types were more frequently observed compared to the previous Western studies. So coming to the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve injury. Mm. Once the injury has occurred, no truly effective treatment is available. Uh, we, we can uh, uh, look back into the history of external branch of superior laryngeal nerve injury well, where Amelita Gallicucci, who was a soprano, who had an injury to the superior laryngeal nerve and she lost her voice. And the surgeon who operated on her had to live in ignominy for the rest of his life. So this is something which is a very... Uh, uh, can he give us Hello. Yeah, uh, I think could the audience move, mute themselves? Uh, sorry, Dr. Ratan, we are doing it. Sometimes people join and it happens. Okay. Uh, really okay. sorry. Once the EBSLN injury has occurred, no truly effective treatment is available and intensive speech therapy is highly recommended to improve the voice, but the, the tensor function of the vocal cord cannot truly be replicated even with laryngeal framework surgery. There is something called lengthening of the laryngeal framework that is type 4 thyroplasty. Even that is not very effective in you know, improving the uh, control of the uh, pitch of the vocal cords and uh, will cause severe uh, consequences for a professional voice user. If, uh, and it is recommended to use intraoperative nerve monitoring for EBSL and uh, uh, of monitoring also, but uh, as I am talking about the management of complications, so to manage these complications, other than intensive speech therapy, there is nothing more we can do. Coming to the more dreaded complication, that is the recurrent laryngeal nerve complication uh, injury. 
laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is a serious complication of thyroid surgery and unilateral injury impairs the voice and occasional swallowing bilateral injury can result in life threatening airway obstruction and usually will end up in preclusive now coming to the anatomy the right nerve is more lateral and the left nerve runs along the tracheoesophageal groove so you can see the uh, right nerve hooking around the uh, subclavian and the left nerve hooking around the arch of aorta so the usual mechanism of injury is touching without visible disruption is the most commonly cited reason for laryngeal paralysis of the thyroid surgery interoperative neural monitoring have indicated that amplitude and latency of the signal are important indicators of nerve nerve damage and increased latency is the first sign of injury continuous nerve monitoring is much better than uh, intermittent nerve monitoring because it uh, uh, predicts the nerve injury in real time but not very avail uh, usually available and it's very expensive machine and uh, signal loss with traction is usually recorded unless the amplitude has dropped more than 50% so using an inm will uh, reliably uh, uh, predict uh, now injury and you can prognosticate that uh, yeah whether the now will function in the immediate post op or not thermal injury from use of uh, hemostatic devices are very uh, 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 what the right word devastating because thermal injury and cautery burns uh, do not recover uh, very well even the ultrasonic and uh, hemostatic devices like ultrasonic bipolar or integrated nrg devices can cause rln now injury when fired within a millimeter of uh, the now but not when distance is more than 2 millimeter rln is a fairly robust now and its ability to recover from compression is evident even in uh, reports where laryngeal paralysis due to compressive goiter, goiter are seen and the, they usually recover after thyroidectomy the guideline is if there is a functioning recurrent laryngeal now always try to preserve the functional and recurrent laryngeal now uh, and even in uh, malignancies where there is loss of uh, recurrent laryngeal now palsy up to 60 about around 58% of the patients will uh, in cases will be excitable on a iom so try to preserve the recurrent laryngeal now if it is excitable on intraoperative nerve monitoring device and it's a fairly robust now which can also stand uh, partial resection and reinnervation unlike we uh, previously thought reinnervation usually occurs in recurrent laryngeal now and uh, uh, in kihar and uh, his colleagues uh, study 18 patients out of 44585 thyroidectomies for cancer only uh, only when the nerve was 50% was preserved 15 of the patient ultimately regained for, uh, function even when you have cut the nerve uh, uh, in uh, 18 of these patients half of them recovered function i mean not more than half of them recovered function uh, even when the nerve was cut that is because laryngeal uh, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, inhibits it i mean the reinnervation is a trend but even after when the nerve regenerates there is no loss of regain of function the reason is that uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve has mixed fibers both adductor and uh, abductor nerve, uh, uh, nerve fibers so whenever it recovers there will be a uh, loss of orientation of these fibers and there will be synkinesis and there is no net regain in function but the tone may improve sometimes synkinesis can cause uh, paradoxical abduction when the adduction signal is has to be fired so the uh, anastomosis has not shown any significant benefit now coming to to understand the problems associated with the uh, uh, recurrent laryngeal we should know the uh, anatomy of the larynx so the prosaic retinal muscle is the only muscle which abducts the larynx along with some parts of interretinoid and uh, anatomy of the larynx the adduction the rest all the muscles are adductor that is the lateral retinoid the transverse retinoid also known as the interretinoid and action of the uh, vocalis coming to unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy the incidence of unilateral recurrent laryngeal palsy is around 1% in last studies even in malignancies the incidence is not very high but uh, when there is extensive no nodal positivity and extensive central compartment nodes it can be quite high it can be tra transient palsy can be as high as 30% but permanent palsy is around 5 to 6% in such cases so non function of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx on the affected side there is lot of loss of abduction and the now lies in the 
paramedian position paramedian position usually occurs because the thoracic muscle is intact and it uh, and gets the cord in the paramedian position the voice may be near normal or sometimes can be breathy usually the the, the body learns to live with the uh, unilateral palsy and the voice improves over time speech therapy is the norm and in more, in more than 60 to 70 percent of the patients speech therapy will suffice and no need of doing any operative correction for unilateral recurrent laryngeal now palsy However, if it persists beyond six months, then uh, uh, medialization procedures can be tried to improve the voice. But usually, in sixty to seventy percent, the speech therapy should suffice. But coming to bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, usually due to result of uh, due to the damage of both the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the cords lie in paramedian position. Uh, paradoxically, the voice is good, but patient can have strider, and the strider can be uh immediate post op sometimes the patient may not have immediate post op surgery strider and can present with strider around a day or two after surgery and usually exacerbated by exacerbated by uh, uh, concomitant hypoparathyroidism uh, which can cause hyper excitability of the muscles and patient can end up in laryngospasm and uh, severe airway compromise which may be life threatening in such a scenario we may have to do a emergency tracheostomy where you open the neck sutures where the trachea is exposed because the thyroidectomy has been done and uh, it's not a difficult tracheostomy uh, but has to be done in an emergency setting to evaluate do a flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy what is the ideal time interval to do a laryngoscopy is in post thyroidectomy usual recommendation is between one week to Two weeks between seven to fourteen days, because when you do uh, 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 laryngoscopy immediate post op, many a patient may have some amount of paresis or palsies, and also there is confounding factor that is uh, intubation trauma, which can uh, 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 influence your interpretation of nerve function. Use an anti-degree Hopkins rod lens system or a flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy to visualize the larynx. And uh, check the uh, position of the cord, whether bilateral cords are mobile or whether cord is in median paramedian or lateral position. Well, posterior glottic uh, gap can be seen in uh, phonation also. Management of vocal cord paralysis, that is unilateral vocal cord paralysis. If it is persistent beyond six months, there are different schools of thought. Some people, when they have, uh, I mean, some surgeons, when they have cut uh, the nerve intraoperatively, and you expect that the laryngeal function is bad and you consult the patient, then we can do an interoperative uh, vocal cord medialization. But generally, most surgeons would prefer a, a postoperative vocal cord uh, medialization because they want to see, because most of the time we can avoid uh, operative vocal cord medialization procedure because speech therapy will usually take care of unilateral vocal cord paralysis. However, if it persists, then medialization procedure like uh, 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 augmentation of the vocal cord with the vocal cord injection can be done, which adds fullness to the vocal cord to help it better oppose, oppose the opposite side. Injection technique is similar, similar regardless of what material is used. There are various materials which were used. Teflon was used to be used, but it used to live, cause a lot of granuloma formation and is usually irreversible and causes a lot of scarring. So the outcomes were not very good. Uh, usually injected into the thyroid or the vocalis and injection can be done endoscopically or percutaneously nowadays uh, previously maybe a decade or two ago most of the injection procedures were done under ga using a direct laryngoscope nowadays due to uh, availability of uh, uh, chip on um, tip uh, camera systems and uh, uh, high definition uh, uh, cameras it's easy to do office space procedure where trans hyoid or trans thyroid injection of the or a trans laryngeal injection of uh, these materials can be done into the paraglottis. But uh, medialization procedure using injection uh, uh, glottoplasty will uh, not correct the posterior glottic gap. That is because the alternate falls anteriorly and uh, because of loss of uh, tone of the vocalis. So that cannot be corrected, but the most of the anterior vocal cut can be mutilated using this technique. 
like i mentioned before teflon used to be used but uh, is generally fallen out of uh, uh, favor nowadays fat and uh, 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 micronized human dermis and collagen uh, hyaluronic acid calcium hydroxypeptide gel and uh, bioplastic these are the ones which are uh, commonly used but most commonly used nowadays is uh, collagen and uh, uh, homo homologous micronized alloderm fat is uh, has requires lot of preparation it and uh, always over correct than under correct uh, inject 30% more than what is required because there is 30% resorption of these materials especially fat the advantage and disadvantages of this procedure these are not permanent and uh, certain materials have a longer rush uh, uh, effect than others but these needs to be uh, uh, repeated uh, six months to a year later hyaluronic acid and uh, carboxymethyl cellulose calcium hydroxypeptide uh, bone based collagen human collagen based collagen human based collagen and uh, autologous fat can be used and it has its various advantages and disadvantages personally i don't have much experience using injection uh, uh, procedures for this so it remains in the domain of laryngologist where we inject is through the trans uh, thyroid uh, membrane we inject into the uh, into the uh, paraglottis or uh, into the uh, paraglottis level so that you uh, uh, medialize the it should be in a uh, uh, fairly de uh, deep uh, uh, plane, not just super deep to the mucosa, should be in the paraglottis or into the thyroid muscle so that it medializes and uh, the vocal cord and the approximation becomes better. In When you use it under local anesthesia, you can give it a real time feedback and you can see that the patient voice improves. When you think the voice has improved to an adequate level, you can stop injecting. Teflon is irreversible, so it is uh, unforgiving, whereas uh, other materials uh, are fairly, uh, you know, reversible. Now, coming to type 1 thyroplasty, that is, suture, uh, I mean, uh, medialization of vocal cord using laryngeal framework surgery. Uh, uh, various materials have been used. Gore-Tex uh, tape can be used or uh, silicone uh, stylistic uh, implant can be used to medialize the cord, making a window in the uh, thyroid cartilage and placing a stylistic material in the paraglottis to push the uh, vocal cords medially. These techniques do not improve the posterior glottic chink. And this also has, is done under local anesthesia ideally so that you can get a real-time uh, uh, feedback from the patient whether the voice is improving or not. Coming to arytenoid reduction for correcting the posterior glottic chink, this is not very easy procedure and requires a lot of uh, expertise. Uh, where you take a suture into the uh, uh, muscular process of the arytenoid and fix the arytenoid in the anterior medial uh, plane so that the vocal cord uh, remains in the medial position or the, or the paramedian position. Coming to bilateral abductor palsy, the cords are in paramedian position and uh, patient does not have uh, show any movement of the vocal cords uh, on uh, laryngoscopy. Here, the maintenance of the airway and preservation of life is the primary goal, and most of the patients uh, may end up with the uh, permanent tracheostomy. If you have preserved the nerve and patient is, which is very uh, unlikely that patient is asymptomatic, so if patient is asymptomatic, you can wait for a few months and keep him under close observation. But most patients will end up with permanent tracheostomy to secure the airway. And uh, my personal experience. If the nerve is intact and you are not burnt the nerve, then most of the nerves will improve within six to six months to a year. And can the tracheostomy can be reversed. Uh, if it is a permanent uh, uh, vocal cord palsy beyond a year, then you can do a laser cordectomy or a laser cordotomy. And uh, laser cordotomy, also known as Kasima's procedure, where you cut the uh, cord uh, anterior to the muscular process along with the you know some amount of removal removal of the ventricular uh, uh, folds also otherwise it can uh, 
ईल एंड कॉडाटोमी में पी आर एल नॉट एन एनी कॉडाटोमी सो दिस कशिमस प्रोसीजर इज नॉट अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट प्रोसीजर टू डू रिक्वायर्स कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड लेडर आइडियली बट यू कैन डू विदाउट कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड लेडर बाई कोल्ड स्टील टेक्निक्स ऑल्सो if you if there's a unil uh, uh, bilateral nerve palsy and you want to avoid a tracheostomy you can do a suture lateralization and this is usually reversible cut the suture and the cord will stay in paramedian position but uh, it is uh, not fair. it's one of the reversible procedure whereas cordectomy and cordotomy are not reversible woodman's uh, uh, procedure that is arachnoidectomy is not done nowadays because woodman's procedure can cause uh, uh, aspiration also because uh, the removal of the arachnoid arachnoid is required for prevention of aspiration so woodman's procedure is usually not done nowadays coming to laryngeal innovation like previously it was thought that recurrent laryngeal now never regains function but lot of animal studies have shown that uh, regeneration is a is a norm in recurrent laryngeal now even across uh, several centimeter gap uh, there are various studies where they have uh, uh, surgically explored the larynx for various uh, injuries and uh, they seen that most of the patients had uh, regenerated to some degree even if it had been ligated also Despite significant renovation of laryngeal muscles, normal motor function never returns to a transected recurrent laryngeal nerve, even if that nerve is precisely realigned and repaired. Repaired, but the now the general consensus is if there is a injury to the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, primary anastomosis has to be tried or a nerve graft has to be put. Alternatively, you can do an use an ansa sava kelly, which has purely more, Uh, ansa hypoglossi has purely motor fibers and that can be rotated and uh, uh, attached to the recurrent remnant uh, distal end of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or can be buried into the uh, paraglottis by making a window on the thyroid cartilage the outcomes with the uh, laryngeal renovation for unilateral vocal cord palsy paralysis is quite good because it restores the function the normal function never returns but the tone of the muscle improves and uh, it helps in improving the voice of the patient but in mean, bilateral recurrent laryngeal no palsy the outcomes are uh, uh, dismal and the uh, laryngeal renovation has no role in bilateral recurrent laryngeal no palsy now key conclusion to conclude management is uh, unilateral palsy the goal is to anterior and posterior gla gla glottic gap has to be addressed arytenoid reduction is irreversible once you do it it is not reversible and continued improvement after one up to one year after type 1 thyroplasty occurs bilateral palsy preservation of airway is the most important goal do a tracheostomy even if you expect a recovery of function tracheostomy to preserve uh, airway the coming to hypothyroidism total thyroidectomy definitely leads to hypothyroidism that is not a question now coming to hypothyroidism in partial thyroidectomy either a hemi or a, a lobectomy can occur in about 11 to 50% of the patients about 1/3 of the patients can develop hypothyroidism predictors are age gender older age female patients presence of my uh, autoimmune antibodies and in multinodular arthritis and perioperative thyroid toxicosis hypothyroidism occurs and uh, usually when the thyroid remnant volume is less than 6 ml hypothyroidism occurs in uh, benign setting hypothyroidism you do give a replacement dose of uh, thyroxine in uh, malignancies you have to give a suppressive dose depending on the risk factor that is low risk high risk uh, thyroid intermediate or high risk thyroid cancer so your the goal tsh goal should be less than 2 and uh, the studies have shown that one in five patients in some form of uh, develop some form of hypothyroidism when you do a partial uh, procedure and most important preoperative predictor is a high normal tsh or presence of uh, autoimmune antibodies coming to very infrequent which is not in the uh, uh, we usually don't see such patients that is thyroid toxic thyroid thyroid i mean hypothyroid patients uh, usually done by endocrine surgeons but in our setting uh, uh, in malignancies and all we don't see lot of uh, thyroid toxic patients 
and the thyroid toxic storm is one of the dreaded complications which is with also a life threatening complication and precipitating event like if it is not not a very well controlled uh, hyperthyroidism the patient can end up with a thyroid thyroid toxic storm or uh, thyroid thyroid uh, crisis that is uh, uh, handling the gland during uh, surgery or trauma or infection can precipitate this and sometimes excess iodine intake uh, as with iodinated contrast agents or uh, anti arrhythmics like amiodarone can precipitate this the physiology is sudden dissociation of thyroid hormone from its binding proteins and uh, this can cause a constellation of signs and symptoms neurological cardiopulmonary gastro uh, gastrointestinal and other systems patient can have arrhythmia tachycardia cardiovascular collapse and even death usually interoperative manipulation has to be stopped beta blockade in administration of cort corticosteroid basically medical management use hydrocortisone uh, uh, in this setting and uh, preoperatively antithyroid medication uh, like uh, methimazole propathyroxine potassium iodide can be used mummy sharta bas mikade he aikte temperature reduction is achieved with cooling blankets acetaminophen post operatively the thyroid toxic patients have altered mental can have altered mentation confusion agitation anxiety this is due to hyper excitable state coming to very uh, these uh, these are not infrequent about 2 to uh, 4% of patient can develop hemorrhage or hematoma uh, and this can, this can be sometimes life threatening and the uh, patient has to be observed very carefully in the immediate post op period and can present usually present within 24 hours but can present uh, 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 between uh, you know up to a, a week uh, following surgery occurs in less than 2% of thyroid uh, surgeries and uh, can be up to 4.39% uh, this is basically uh, the there is an interoperative uh, component also the surgeon has to be more experienced and more alert if he is not very attentive during the hemostasis this can lead to higher incidence of hemorrhage and hematoma uh, review of publication containing large cohort of more than 1000 patients from single center found reexploration rates of around 0.3 to 1.2% the reexploration rates across various studies are much lower when uh, in the hands of uh, frequently i mean high volume thyroid surgeons rather than infrequent thyroid surgeons uh liu and et al uh, conducted a meta analysis where he found that older age male sex and grave disease patients on antithrombotic agents and bilateral large resection that is bilateral operation neck dissections and reoperative surgeries are significant risk factors for post operative hemorrhage uh suzuki et al also included obesity and blood transfusion on the day of surgery as a uh, risk factor for hematoma or hemorrhage multiple studies have shown that post operative hemorrhage and hematoma rates are equivalent in patients who have not uh, who have who have had a wound drainage or not so placing a suction drain is not a in our setting we use suction drainage for all our cases because we operate malignant patients but in most uh, centers now when uh, especially with endocrine surgeons when they do a hemithyroidectomy or a lobectomy they would not place a suction drain in a limited dissection so placing a suction drain with or without a suction drain has not shown any difference in uh, hemorrhage rates and uh, it is uh, up to the surgeon to decide on case to case basis the proponents of uh, suction drainage uh, placement and uh, people who oppose uh, placement of drain prevention is meticulous hemostasis uh, newer vessel sealing devices also have not shown to uh, decrease hematoma rates is basically how you interoperatively manage it during after surgery do a vessel manual check for hemostasis use, use warm saline to give a wash so that the uh, vessel spasm uh, uh, decreases and uh, whatever bleeding is uh, there can be recognized intraoperatively cervical pressure dressing which was previously used in older days has not recommended now because it can obscure uh, hematoma obscure uh, uh, hematomas and uh, patient should be awakened from anesthesia in a man manner to avoid uh, coughing that is patient should not uh, stress himself during coughing which can open up vessels management is usually occurs in the first 24 hours usually presents with neck swelling pain oozing from the suture line ecchymosis of neck 
The patient can also have dysphagia, odonophagia, can have present with strider due to laryngospasm or laryngeal edema due to the uh, uh, decreased venous return due to compression in the neck. Patient can present with respiratory stutter. These are potentially less threatening complications. If not managed in an emergent fashion, patient can die. Uh, early recognition is essential as long as the hematoma is present, the, uh, the, result, the airway edema and difficulty in the keeps on increasing as you, you know, delay managing this. And uh, in a severe hematoma, we might have to do a tracheostomy to secure the airway. In severe tight hematomas decompress immediately. Don't wait for the patient to be shifted to the OT. Decompress immediately by opening the sutures and then you can manage the hematoma in the OR, operation theater. Air, uh, airway control, definitely if the patient is having respiratory distress. I had the unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have done, uh, I think, a couple of uh, uh, summits for airway distress due to hematoma formation back when I was in my training days many years ago. But tracheostomy is not very difficult in this case. So once you open the suture, you will see where the trachea and open, open. But um, patient requires uh, managing control of bleeding uh, after patient being taken into the OR. Because endotracheal intubation may be difficult due to laryngopharyngeal edema due to uh, decreased venous return due to compression in the neck. And uh, most importantly, all the post-operative patients involved in, uh, all the people involved in uh, patients post-operative care, they should, be in, should know how to manage uh, uh, hematoma and they should know the protocol, like whom to be, or how to examine for, how to look for uh, hematoma formation. And in the first 24 hours, keep an uh, uh, eye on the neck. If there is any ecchymosis or swelling in the neck, have blood, uh, red blood in the drains, then the resident has to be informed immediately and appropriate management has to be done. Coming to less uh, uh, significant uh, complications like hypotrophic scar, maybe less significant for us, but some patients will have severe uh, uh, agony, mental agony due to this. And uh, uh, especially in women because it uh, causes cosmetic disfigurement. Ways to mitigate this is placing the incision in the natural skin trees, which can help hide the scar. The length of the scar can be minimized and uh, in uh, those with the large breasts, it can be placed at a higher skin trees level. Energy devices uh, you should be avoided when, you, when cutting the skin. Uh, people tend to have a uh, you know habit of cutting the skin using uh, monopolar cautery in uh, pure cut mode, but this increases scar formation. The restriction of skin edges should be considered before closing, and suture should be removed in a timely fashion when you have put a, a, a non-absorbable suture. Uh, people use subcritical non-absorbable sutures to put subcritical sutures, which will not removed between five to seven days. Patient can have unsightly scar. Various uh, treatment modalities like intranasal steroid injection and laser therapy in use. And uh, importantly, these remote access endoscopic thyroid surgeries, especially transoral thyroid surgery, avoid scar in the neck and. Uh, in certain uh, populations, patient ask for uh, this kind of, uh, especially in Korea, patients ask for uh, remote access thyroid surgeries because they are very concerned about their appearance. In our setting, uh, not very, uh, not commonly done. Like other infrequent, uh, uh, insignificant, not so significant uh, complications of seroma formation can be a source of anxiety and discomfort for the patient. Collection of fluid clinically identified within a surgical cavity in the post period usually increases when you have done a neck dissection. Uncommon and occurs in up to 7% of cases. Factors like old age, increased body mass index that the obese patients are one of the risk factors. Serum management includes observation, serial needle aspirations, and placement of suction drain. Usually, conservative management is a norm, repeated aspiration. Uh, and uh, if they, you have to, we have to put a, in a, open the suture if it gets in, infected. Always when you drain with repeated aspirations, use sterile technique to avoid infection. So coming to infection, very uncommon thyroid and parathyroid surgery is a clean surgical in, uh, clean uh, and uh, surgical site infections. Clean, it's a clean surgery type one uh, 
uh, aseptic surgery and uh, the surgical site infection rarely occurs and uh, preoperative perioperative uh, antibiotics are not shown to reduce the incidence of wound infections and are not uh, routinely used infections either present as next cellulitis uh, which may require oral antibiotics are usually due to infected seromas deep infections should raise the suspicion of either the existing tract injury and the neck has to be explored especially when the drain has stubbed the uh, collection placement of drain neither prevents post operative bleeding nor do they facilitate early diagnosis of bleeding and infection is associated with uh, drain placement there is a higher incidence of infection when drain is established so that's why there are proponents who say that drain placement is not required when in minor thyroid surgeries coming to some of the dreaded complications we usually seen in our setting when we do malignancies i mean surgery for malignancy thyroid digestive tract injury pre operative tumor involvement of the trach and esophagus should be anticipated based on clinical radiographic and endoscopic findings inadvertent injury to the other digestive tract in thyroidectomy is extremely rare unrecognized injury may present with neck pain dysphagia subcutaneous emphysema fever uh, elevated uh, blood counts systemic signs of sepsis diagnosis is confirmed by gastrography swallow or barium swallow Management can either be conservative drainage and antibiotics, or if it is a esophageal tear causing a significant trend, then patient will require reoperation. And patient is usually kept nil per oral for several days. Recognized esophageal injury should be closed with inverting uh, absorbable sutures and wound copiously irrigated before closing the drain wound with with the suction. Always put a drain when you anticipate when you have a uh, esophageal injury. usually the mucosal uh, uh, whenever in malignant setting only the muscles may be involved and the mucosa may not be breached very uncommon for the mucosal mucosa to be breached and you don't need negative i mean 1 cm margins in thyroid so just shave the disease of the uh, of the muscle with negative margin that is tracheal injury not very frequent You, if detected close primarily with absorbable sutures when primary closure is not possible placement of a tracheostomy tube or a segmental resection of the trachea can be done sharp muscles may be used to buttress the surgical closure patient may present a few days after surgery with neck surgical emphysema and swelling may be due to the dislodgement of small uh, uh, clots which are in the uh, anastomotic site when you have done a uh, uh, tracheal anastomosis and in this setting management is conservative uh, admission and observation but if there is a significant surgical emphysema patient may be taken back to the operation theater to uh, redo the anastomosis coming to tracheomalacia this is seen in large thyroids i have no personal experience with the uh, tracheomalacia even in large uh, thyroids um, tracheomalacia is not very common even though it has been mentioned Uh, trachea usually becomes weak from long standing pressure and subsequent narrows uh, with a negative inspiratory force of inhalation due to venturi effect when you breathe forcefully the pressure decreases so the trachea may be pulled in the incidence of this problem varies up to 10% and is related to long standing or significant retrosternal extension usually more than 3 cm of um, three cartilaginous rings are involved recognized intraoperatively as a soft collar stable trachea upon palpation it can lead to post operative airway problems and uh, patient should be kept intubated overnight or alternately can do a tracheostomy long term endotracheal tube placement causes a paratracheal fibrosis and stents the uh, trachea uh various other procedures like tracheopexy mini plate fixation mesh splinting or trachea uh, and even tracheal resection can be performed depending on the degree of tracheomalacia and most importantly before diagnosing tracheomalacia rule out bilateral vocal cord paralysis whenever the patient follows respiratory distress other infrequent complication like honor syndrome that is uh, usually done is seen when patient has a concomitant neck dissection that is injury to the cervical sympathetic chain can also occur now 
coming to kai lake this is not some this is something which we uh, do see in our uh, uh, practice because we do extensive neck dissections and this complication results from inadvertent inadvertent injury to the thoracic duct or one of its branches and usually on the left side of the neck during lymph node dissection in 2% even right side patients can and, uh, can have uh, uh, on the right side the lymphatic duct can be injured and the incidence is around 0.6 to 1.4% for central node dissection and 4.4 to 8.3% for lateral dissections. Usually manifests as a milky white fluid. And for patients who have not had drains, which is not in our setting, a fluctuant swelling under the wound is seen. High leak, if it is uh, there, it impairs wound healing can can lead to laryngeal edema and uh, prolonged hospital stay. And chyle contains chylomacrons and a significant chyle can lead to loss of fat, protein, electrolytes and uh, lymphocytes, that is white blood cells, and can result in severe nutritional, metabolic and immunologic disorders, that is infection. Management is conservative in low to medium volume leaks. Q rates are very high, 58 to 100 percent, may take up to three weeks to resolve, that is the hospital stay has to be prolonged. Patient may remain fasting and receive total parental nutrition when there is nothing is absorbed from the gut and the chyle formation also is less. Somastatotin analog that is octreotide uh, causes planktic uh, contraction and decreases the blood flow to the gut and there is decreased chyle formation. When conservative method fail, especially in significant chyle leak, uh, uh, a patient may, will, needs to be taken into the operation theater and identify the leak and identify the site of leak and uh, it has to be controlled by oversaving the duct or if it is cannot be oversaved, if the sewage, then you can use a muscle uh, 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 muscle to you know oversee the uh, your uh, site of leak uh, using uh, non absorbable silk Sometimes patient can end up with the chylothorax and thoracoscopic uh, uh, ligation of the duct can be done. And even interventional radiologists uh, have are known to ligate the chyle duct, uh, uh, but not usually required because VATS ligation is not, not very difficult. Coming to anesthetic complications like difficult inflammation, especially in large thoracs, use a video laryngoscope to visualize the larynx and uh, intubate. The intubation is not difficult uh, in this setting, when in, especially in to, today's time when you have uh, various devices to visualize the larynx. If it is, if you are anticipating uh, severe, uh, I mean, uh, difficult intubation, direct laryngoscopy and intubation can be done uh, in under uh, giving after, under local anesthesia. Predictors are increased bulky patient neck with the large neck, reduced mouth opening, uh, older age, and uh, thyroid related risk factors like large thyroid swelling infiltrating the trachea. And uh, radiological CT may show tracheal compression involvement of the trachea. Usually, uh, uh, should not be a problem using direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy device. Mortality histologically, thyroid surgery was associated with such uh, high mortality rate of 40% in 1800s. Nowadays, the 30 day mortality is very less, around 0.6%, and most deaths are associated with combination of older age, large goitus, and airway complications. Very, very rare. Hardly see any patients die due to thyroid. Post operative hemorrhage is the, one of the only potentially life threatening complications of thyroidectomy, along with the bilateral and laryngeal injury, which may be unrecognized. Coming to how to mitigate complications, accurate anatomical knowledge, standardization of surgical procedures, meticulous surgery, application of near technologies like uh, IONM, interoperative nerve monitoring, and uh, identity using uh, ICG or uh, autofluorescence, uh, I mean, uh, immunofluorescence, uh, sorry, uh, autofluorescence uh, devices to detect the parathyroid. Uh, uh, vascularity and specialty training in thyroid surgery. Consistently uh, across various studies has shown that those who do less than 30 thyroid surgeries per year have higher complication rates and uh, you know, high volume thyroid surgery. That is more than 30 surgeries per year. So auditing our results and improving outcomes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Ratan. Uh, a very comprehensive lecture on management of complications post thyroidectomy. I think you have included each and every possible complication and the uh, management of uh, every complication. Thank you so much. I uh, just one question uh, or uh, what do you suggest, uh, Dr. Ratan, to residents? Do, uh, does this loops or magnification, uh, magnifying glasses has a role uh, in preventing these complications? What do you suggest? Like yes, uh, IOMB yeah. said, yeah. Yeah, magnifying. So uh, my topic was management of complications, but yeah. preventing complications definitely uh, improves uh, outcomes. Magnifying loops definitely uh, improves outcomes because you can actually see the vascularity of the parathyroid gland and vascularity and the uh, the, uh, the the microvasculature of the recurrent laryngeal now. So you can actually dissect the now better. You can dissect the parathyroid better when you use magnification because your visual acuity increases. So always. The recommendation is use loops whenever possible for thyroid surgeries because consistently it has shown better results with uh, magnification. Correct. Uh, I think there are two, three questions. Uh, one question is any role of frozen section to identify parathyroid and autotransplantation yeah, without I, of parathyroid removal in adventurity? Yeah. yeah, I had uh, mentioned that. So whenever you have a doubt whether parathyroid is there or not, even uh, when the, the gland is not being removed, it is in situ. You can take a section of the gland and part of the gland, about uh, a millimeter of the gland, and send for frozen section. If it turns out to be parathyroid, leave it in situ. Alternatively, if you have resected the gland, then you can send part of the gland for frozen section. And if it is a parathyroid, then tissue, then you can reimplant the rest of the gland into the viable muscle. So viable muscle is a muscle which is not turned dark. So sometimes the retraction and all will cause the sternocleidomaster to be turned dark. So these muscles are not very uh, useful for, you know, auto implantation, uh, you know, place it, uh, make multiple blockages and place it at a higher level in the upper neck. So, and whenever you place, there should not be any hematoma in the muscle. Uh, so there are different techniques of you know auto implantation you can alternatively inject in the brachial arteries definitely you should do a parathyroid uh, uh, you know confirmation by frozen section yes and especially in malignant yes. setting especially in malignant setting yes. so what is your opinion on leaving disease i think you have touched upon this also what is your opinion on leaving disease on the nerve where there is so, an infiltrative disease rather than yeah. sacrificing on dis uh, shaving from so the, the general consensus is there is no uh, you know uh, equipoise on this the consensus uh, is in a functioning recurrent laryngeal now always preserve the nerve because the distant metastasis is not because you have left the so some people that there, there are people uh, different schools of argument they say that living behind disease may patient may have through a decision mess the decision mess is basically the biology of the tumor not because you have left behind disease so you do an r1 resection uh, that is microscopically disease may be positive on the now but if now is functioning preoperatively you can you have to try to preserve the now by doing uh, uh, something called dissecting with the knife and leaving uh, removing as much uh, of the now you uh, above the epineurium you can dissect and you can fairly because recurrent larger now is a fairly robust now even if there is a loss of function in the immediate post op there is an intact now usually regains function over time so like i said laryngeal renovation does occur and the, uh, the renovation outcomes are better when the now is partially resected rather than completely resected i mean uh, completely transected so recurrent larger now has to be preserved whenever possible. Leaving behind disease, uh, like leaving gross disease is not uh, recommended, but uh, you can remove the entirety of the now. If now is grossly infiltrated, uh, there's no point in uh, you know dissecting the now. But uh, I mean, most of the time it is closely abutting the now or just uh, partially encasing the now. And you can see the now, you can trace the now, then you can uh, dissect. Sometimes it now is grossly infiltrated and recurrent laryngeal now function is also not there. Then the, I don't think there is much point in you know resecting. I, I think mean, uh, if, yes. I think if you can make a plane between the nerve and the disease. Yes. Uh, yes. Clearly, uh, so then in that case, at least perioperatively, you can save the nerve. So if you can say that. So in case of bilateral laryngeal nerve damage, at what point of time will you consider permanent tracheostomy? I think you already laryngeal yeah. nerve damage. If patient is having postoperative uh, airway compromise, do permanent tracheostomy as early as possible. You do not wait for the nerve to recover. 
and uh, because a patient will not be alive uh, when uh, till the nerve recovers even if you have preserved the nerve because tricostomy is something which is reversible so you can do a tricostomy to preserve the airway and if the patient recovers you can always reverse the tricostomy always do a tricostomy to preserve the air and um, i've seen a couple of patients where patient ended the with the tricostomy and they had normal vocal cord function after 6 months when we had to uh, reverse the tricostomy where it was unexpected but laryngeal function recovers as long as you have preserved the nerve or nerve is intact if nerve is cut or cauterized then even if the reanimation occurs like i said before the innovation is not very uh, coherent so function never recovers correct how should we go about a case where patient has stridor immediate post op on table how to plan extubation and role of steroids in nerve paralysis uh, there are a lot of uh, random i mean uh, 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 meta analysis on this whether steroids improve or not steroids are not shown to like in facial now steroids have some benefit but in recurrent laryngeal now there is meta analysis also the recurrent laryngeal now i mean if you include all the evidence for this study, this presentation it will go on for hours together so there are meta analysis which are not shown any there is not much benefit in using uh, dexamethasone uh, post op but dexamethasone have uh, improves uh, you know smooth extubation because uh, has anti emetic function and uh, decreases laryngeal edema and all that but in terms of uh, nerve uh, uh, injury or uh, now recovery it doesn't have much function i think the question also means uh, like they want to ask this thing that if the patient has immediate post op like on table when we extubate the patient the patient has stridor then you do a tracheostomy patient has stridor or there are two schools of thought i mean you can do a immediate tracheostomy or you can pay, pay, place the patient if you have cut the now you know that patient will end up will uh, will have a permanent uh, no palsy i mean Uh, prolonged nerve palsy or permanent nerve palsy but if you have preserved the nerve you think that the nerve may regain function after a day you can keep the patient intubated and re extubate after a day or two still the patient uh, that is a protocol there and uh, different uh, people have different protocols but this is usually the protocol followed by most people they keep the patient intubated wait for a couple of days can use steroids not shown to have much benefit but sometimes the paresis and all will improve within a couple of days and patient can uh, be extubated yes i think the perioperatively like you rightly said we can expect the post operative outcome also most of the cases if the nerve is damaged or cauterized you will be expecting that and even with the and nowadays with the use of inm also yeah. that we usually get the uh, to know the function of the nerve perioperatively most of the time Yeah. so we can plan accordingly yeah and, and so, a lot yeah. of studies have shown that uh, you, the previously the previous study shown that the permanent uh, palsy rates uh, do, do not improve but there are studies which have shown that even the permanent palsy rates are lesser when you use an inm because especially when you use a continuous nerve monitoring device because uh, that gives you real time data whether the nerve is being injured or not so yes, yes uh, I, use inm whenever you have access to inm and uh, don't show your bravado by you know uh, dissecting without inm always use inm because this has shown to benefit and always use magnification when you have access to magnification i think dr ratan lot of questions for this your lecture i think we'll take one or two more is it okay with you yeah yeah i can take all in how much time do you expect unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy to recover almost there are similar questions only yeah 6 months uh, approximately you wait for 6 months to a year if your uh, speech therapy doesn't take care of uh, the voice problems then you can do uh, injection laryngoplasty or uh, laryngeal framework surgery usually injection laryngoplasty is something which is done nowadays uh, people have stopped using the uh, a uh, laryngeal or framework surgery because most of the time injection laryngeal passage done in an outpatient setting and it is repeatable in fact there is a meta analysis also which has shown that in fact it takes usually 6 to 9 months uh, yeah. and Up the recovery may not be yeah recovery may not be complete but like, like you rightly said you can wait up to one year also because they may yeah. not be complete response but uh, recovery but there will be some degree of recovery in up to two third of the cases Good so it is recommended laryngeal yeah. reinnervation occurs in almost all cases that's what has been seen previously we thought that laryngeal recurrent laryngeal nerve never uh, regrows it does uh, improve 
but the yeah. outcomes may not be very good because there will be mismatch in the supply of the abductors and adductors and sometimes there will be very good recovery sometimes the recovery may not be it can be worsening of uh, there can be worsening of symptoms also because uh, when there is a signal for abduction patient can have abduction that is synchinesis can also occur but usually recovery is the norm when there is an intact uh, now and lunge uh, recurrent lunge is fairly robust now and uh, I think so. Maximum you can wait up to one year. Like we one usually year. say yes, six yes. months, or up to one year you can wait. And if there is no recovery after that, then you can go ahead and plan accordingly. So if one side of nerve is transected uh, accidentally, should we proceed with the rest of the surgery and risk the other now or come out and plan later? It depends on the skill of the surgeon also. So whenever uh, you expect a nerve injury, you expect an always uh, dissect on the opposite side because of the normal now and then dissect on the affected side so that you are not tense and uh, ang anxious when you are operating operating on the uh, in the now where you are expecting injury to occur yes and uh, there is something called stage procedure but if you have cut the nerve and you are not going to leave you are going to leave behind disease i have not never encountered where i had to abandon surgery because of uh, injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve that should uh, injury rates are very low in my in my case so yes that that, that and in inm and all you can using inm you can uh, prognosticate whether the nerve will recover or not because if less than 50% amplitude the, the post operative injury uh, paresis or uh, palsy rate is higher and um, yeah we we should uh, remove never leave behind disease sometimes if it is if your patient does not want to accept uh, no palsy you have a pre pre operative counseling with the patient you can do something called stage uh, surgery that is uh, dissect one side wait for a few weeks and then um, in, uh, because thyroid cancer is a fairly slow growing tumor so you can do that it, that has also been been done that is stage procedures stage uh, surgeries but not in uh, routine surgery Yes, I agree. So it can be done staged also, or naturally you have to be. So there, like school of thought, which I already said, you can go ahead and do the non-disease side first, save the nerve nicely, save the parathyroids, and go and then go to the disease side, so that you are at peace of mind that you have saved your nerve. Again, it depends upon the uh, skill of the and the experience of the surgeon as well. And use of INM does help in these situations if you have uh, it available with you. So I think that's the last question. Uh, could you please repeat about RLN uh, anastomosis if nerve is damaged and its success rate? Yeah, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve renovation surgery is uh, is the norm for unilateral vocal cord paralysis. If the one side of the nerve is cut, always reanastomose because it improves the tone of the uh, the affected side of the larynx. So the voice outcomes are much better when you re renovate using using various techniques. Ansa is uh, something which is used. Uh, mm. Answer to uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve anastomosis or end to end anastomosis. The nerve anastomosis should be tension free, and uh, success rate is fairly high, around more than seventy percent. But uh, seventy two. I mean, uh, there are reports of about ninety percent success rate. But even uh, when you do surgery after a year, after a year also, up to two years you can do surgery. But after two years, if you do renal stenosis, uh, then the outcomes are very bad. Just like in any even in facial nerve, the outcomes are bad when you do anastomosis after a couple of years. But six months to a year also, you can try reanastomosis. Somebody has cut the nerve and the patient has presented to you. You can do a laryngeal uh, renovation procedure using ansa apoplasi to recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, anastomosis. The success rate is quite uh, high. So every time, whenever there is any damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, please uh, uh, do the anastomosis or a graft cable uh, placement or like uh, Dr. Ratan said, uh, anastomose it with the ANSA or something, even the hypoglossal uh, this anastomosis has been uh, described, but that naturally yes, yes. leads to some degree of uh, this paresis of the tongue. So that usually is not uh, done. Yeah, so they, are, they, they use phrenic nerve also, partial phrenic nerve yes. grafting also. But why do you want to injure the phrenic nerve for or the hypoglossal nerve for that? For something Correct. which is not going to regain function significantly, it will only improve the tone. It will not be normal. So yeah. it's only for unilateral vocal force paralysis. Yes. So I think a lot of questions, discussion, and a very uh, I think fruitful set. So thank you once again, Dr. Ratan. Uh, thank you, Madam, for providing this opportunity. And uh, yeah, look forward to many more uh, interactions. Yes. Uh, 
Hello. Hello. Thanks to the yeah. uh, AFU vote. Um, uh, if the uh, laryngeal nerve is preserved, then we have an excellent method to help in the regeneration. What we do in ACTREC is that we have an imported device which combines electric stimulation and EMG biofeedback. So um, using that, we help the um, muscles to regain the functions, maintain the tone, and it also helps in the uh, regeneration of the nerves. So we have uh, tried it with a, a couple of patients that it did really good results and there are papers on it also. Yeah, the, the concept is that as long as the muscle tone is, whenever you excite the muscle, the, it's just like exercising the muscle. The, the tone of the muscle is uh, maintained and whenever the renovation, renovation usually occurs in larynx, I mean in uh, recurrent larynx now. So whenever the renovation occurs, the tone is maintained. But, uh, yeah, the outcomes are slightly, I mean, better when you when you continue to excite. That is what the speech therapy does. Whenever you you a vigorous speech therapy, the tone of the affected side is maintained. That's why the outcomes are better when you use speech therapy. Just like a physiotherapy, basically physiotherapy of for the larynx. Yeah, so uh, we couple uh, the exercises with the uh, stimulation and the EMG biofeedback and uh, with the good airway uh, clearance techniques and physiotherapy, chest physiotherapy. So we can, you know, wait for the tracheostomy to be done or it can be reversed if it is al already done in a um, shorter uh, time period. So for the long term management, it is very effective. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you, Ratan and Mohua. Uh, with this, we conclude today's session. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day, everyone.